of injective PEPs and GIPS states. And this is joint work with Andres Molnar and Ignacio Sira. Thank you very much. Uh, is the microphone working? Yes? Good. So I'll be talking about a new quantum algorithm for preparing certain types of quantum antibody states. And uh, I would like to start motivating this work by going back to, uh, all the way to the very beginning of um, quantum computation, namely the problem of simulating a quantum system by another quantum system. Now, this problem of uh, quantum simulation actually has two parts to it. One is, of course, implementing the dynamics of, say, a Hamiltonian, for which uh, they are very, very good and almost optimal algorithms. But there's another part to that problem, which is to prepare the state that you want to run the dynamics on in the first place. And this is somehow not so clear. And um, part of the reason is because it somehow requires uh, some, some kind of structural uh, understanding of uh, these uh, states, for example, the ground states uh, that you want to prepare. Um, but uh, for certain many body states, um, there, have been a, there has been a lot of progress uh, in recent years. Uh, for example, in expressing these kind of states as uh, projective entangled passes, like this tensor net toxic, which I will talk about in a, mi uh, in a moment. And it can also do similar kind of things uh, for, um, for final temperature uh, cases. Uh, and there is a special case. One thing you can do is to look at uh, classical dis Gibbs distributions and um, sampling from them. Uh, so you have some, you might have some kind of um, um, classical icing spins, and uh, you uh, you uh, you turn turn the temperature to a, uh, uh, to well to a, to a certain temperature, and you want to sample from the code from the corresponding Gibbs distribution. Now this problem has a lot of uh, applications, even beyond uh, physics, um, and um, is is quite an interesting problem in itself. Um, and finally, um, one another another reason why we. Um, um, what, what is this an interesting algorithm is that uh, it somehow gives a, a couple of new methods of thinking about um, um, sources of quantum speed, uh, speed up. So for example, in this talk, I'll be focusing on gaining some quantum speed ups by um, exploiting locality in the system. So um, this is what I'm going to be talking about. So I'll start by giving you a necess the necessary background of, on the kind of states I'll be uh, preparing. Um, then I'll give you some kind of very naive algorithm, which sort of contains some of the ingredients, uh, but is somehow a little bit uh, unsatisfactory. I'll then actually tell you the improved algorithm that we, that we came up with um, and the necessary ingredients. And um, I'll end with a, 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 an analysis of the runtime and the underlying assumptions to make this efficient. OK. So uh, let me tell you about something called projected entangled pair states, or PEPs in short. So these kind of states have to um, uh, uh, come from uh, the study of uh, quantum antibody systems. And there you have a fundamental problem, which is that usually you look at, um, at systems of very many spins. And then, of course, you have the problem that uh, the dimension of an underlying Hilbert space decays exponentially with the number of spins that you have. So in particular, it's quite hard to even write down the states that, uh, that you're interested in. But of course, physicists aren't necessarily interested in, in all states. They might be interested in very special states. And one class of, the, uh, of these states are these famous uh, ground sets of local gap Hamiltonians, uh, which are conjectured to have very, uh, some very special entanglement properties. And uh, this has sort of uh, led to people uh, coming up with some, some, some new um, ansatzes for, uh, for describing the wave functions of these uh, ground states. So uh, the way this works is uh, you imagine having these, um, having these uh, strongly interacting, uh, locally interacting spins on, say, a lattice. And uh, what you do for, for this ansatz is for each uh, edge of this, uh, of this lattice to introduce a maximally uh, entangled state of some uh, dimension d called the bond dimension. Um, and uh, so this sort of defines this product state of, of uh, maximally entangled states. And now what you do is uh, for each vertex of this lattice, uh, you introduce a linear operator. Um, that uh, maps these four um, q uh, qubits into what's called a physical space, so, uh, so to speak. And if you, uh, if you do this for every vertex, then this is what's called a projected entangled pair states, or PEPs. And these kind of states um, are um, strongly conjectured to be able to efficiently capture these ground states. And the idea is, of course, that if, D, if capital D is not too large, say a constant, uh, then uh, this, uh, this whole description only depends on very few uh, parameters and is much retractable. Um, one word of warning, though, it's called projected entangled pair states, but these linear operators are actually just linear operators. They're not necessarily projected, projectors. Uh, and in fact, uh, in this talk, I will only be considering a, a special case of those, namely the case when these uh, red operators are invertible, which, uh, of course, is uh, the ge generic trace um, provided the dimensions um, are uh, large enough accordingly. 
Okay, so this is one class of states I'll be considering. The second class I'll be considering um, is the class of Gibbs states. Um, so Gibbs, uh, so Gibbs states are, of, uh, of course, the states, um, the states that, that describe um, physical systems in uh, thermal equilibrium. And uh, the way it works is that you have some some kind of um, again local Hamiltonian H. And I'll be making a restriction in this um, uh, in the setup where I only allow commuting um, local terms. Um, and uh, for some given temperature, or inverse temperature H, uh, beta, um, you consider this density matrix here, e to the minus beta H divided by the partition function. This is your thermal state. Now, rather than working with this density matrix itself, uh, in this talk, I'll be looking at the purification thereof. And it's actually not that difficult to construct one. So I mean, the way it works is you have a bunch of maximally entangled states. And then uh, you apply uh, e to the minus beta H over 2 to a half, uh, half of this. And it's not that difficult to see that this actually is indeed a purification. It's probably easier to see what's going on um, Victoria so you have this uh, lat uh, your lattice of, of system sites. And then what you do is for each of the sites of the system, you introduce an ancilla party of the same dimension and put them into a maximum entangled state with, which, with its cor corresponding um, system particle. And then what you do is apply e to the uh, minus beta h to or at beta h over 2 uh, to half of the system. So here I've sort of drawn it for a um, uh, for nearest, for nearest neighbor um, Hamiltonian on um, uh, to, uh, to the square lattice, and of course the order doesn't matter because I've assumed that um, the local terms commute. So these are the two states, uh, classes of states I'll be considering, namely, first of all, injective PEPs, second of all, uh, Gibbs states um, of the type that I've just described. And, um, but more generally, you could sort of imagine a slightly more general setup where you take some graph of, uh, of a well-defined spatial dimension and uh, you distribute some uh, maximum entangled states on, on this graph and then you sort of consider these um, red blobs which are uh, commuting finite rate or local and invertible operators on um, acting on these uh, pair states. Okay, so we want to... Um, prepare these states and one and what you can do for for states of this form is is to write down something that's called a parent hamiltonian so a parent hamiltonian is a local hamiltonian that has this state here as its uh, unique ground state uh, and it's not that hard to do that so let me show you how this works um, so you take um, psi which is uh, which is uh, a state of this form and um, you take an edge um, in this graph, so uh, let's call it mu. And now, what you what uh, what you can do is invert all of this uh, this red operators here that touch this uh, this edge mu. So if you if you do that, you basically um, uh, for a given edge, you undo uh, you isolate this uh, this edge from uh, edge from the from the rest of the state or rest of the graph. And now what you can do is simply projecting uh, into the orthogonal complement of this maximally uh, entangled state. This will of course uh, kill um, or uh, well, send the state to zero, and uh, if you want to turn, turn turn this into a Hamiltonian, better make it um, Hermitian. So that's why I get Hermitian. Uh, this is this, of course, is still zero. And now what I can do is sum over all the edges. So this gives the, still gives zero. Um, so that's quite a uh, simple construction. Now this operator here um, that defines uh, a Hamiltonian. Uh, it's by construction local, because for any, uh, any given edge, there's any uh, finitely many um, of these red operators that touch it. Um, so it's, uh, so it's um, well, it's, it's, so it's local. It has, a, uh, it has this state as ground state. And if you stare at it for long enough, you realize that it's actually the unique ground state of this parent Hamiltonian. OK. So with this parent Hamiltonian, let me uh, give you sort of a, na a naive way of uh, preparing uh, this, it's, uh, its ground state. So I just copied this, the formula for the parent Hamiltonian on, this, on, on the slide from, from last slide. And one thing you could do is, if you have uh, such, a, uh, such a Hamiltonian whose ground state you want to prepare, um, you, what you can do is um, connect it uh, adiabatically to, um, to, say, a trivial Hamiltonian. So you basically use the adiabatic theorem to, to prepare the states. Now, in case you're not familiar with, uh, with this term, let me quickly tell you what it is. So uh, the adiabatic theorem uh, basically uh, says some, uh, something more or less intuitive. It says if you have a path of, uh, of Hamiltonians with an instantaneous ground state, um, 
uh, then you can do the following. You can, uh, you can start in, uh, in the ground set of the initial Hamiltonian of this path and evolve it according to this time-dependent Schrodinger equation where you change the Hamiltonian along this path sufficiently slowly. And if you do it sufficiently slowly, uh, the adiabatic theorem tells you that uh, you'll always stay close uh, to the uh, instantaneous ground state. So in particular, at the end of the path, you will be close to the final ground state. So this is what the adiabatic theorem says. Sufficiently slowly here basically um, means that you have some, uh, some uh, up a bound on the uh, on the runtime or, or on on the time you evolve the Schrödinger equation for tau, and uh, at least no, at least schematically uh, the kind of bounds that you get sort of depends uh, on the on the norm of uh, of the um, derivative of the Hamiltonians or possibly even having derivatives. There's some dependence on the spectral gap delta, which across along the gap, and uh, there is usually a one over epsilon, um, uh, where epsilon is the, er the allowed error um, depends in there as well. So. You can use this theorem to uh, prepare uh, the, uh, the state that you want uh, simply by uh, connecting this uh, Hamiltonian to uh, something trivial. So for example, if these uh, this, uh, operators here went there, then, then you would just simply have a uh, sum of projectors. So the ground state would be something very easy. It would be just a product state of, um, of maximally entangled states. So um, you, you, could connect, you could connect it, for example, to, uh, to, this, uh, to, the, to the state, uh, to, the, to the Hamiltonian where, whose ground state is just this product state. So the way this, uh, so again, you have, you have this, this sum of projectors, this is your initial state, and then uh, you, want, you connect it to the thing that you want. And now you start evolving this uh, according to the adiabatic theorem or I told you the time dependent shooting equation. And if you do this uh, sufficiently slowly, then you will end up very close to the state that you want. So, of course, you'd, you have to then, if you want to do this as an algorithm, do a, do a proper runtime analysis. And uh, just from the adiabatic theorem, the, um, the, 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 the runtime that you need basically squares that says, um, well, that's, that's the square of the, of, of the, uh, of the uh, norm of the Hamiltonian. Um, and since you have about n terms, when well, there's a system size, so since you have about n terms that you change here, this will be about n squared. Um, so this is just uh, so this is just the time that you need to evolve the Schrödinger equation for. But this is of course not an algorithm. This is a Schrödinger equation. So if you actually want to turn this into an algorithm, or in other words, a circuit, what you need to do is to turn this uh, the Schrödinger evolution into a sequence of gates. And there's um, sort of an obvious way to do this, which is to use Hamiltonian simulation. So um, just as a reminder, reminder in Hamiltonian simulation, what you uh, what you have is a possible time-dependent Hamiltonian, and you want to turn the unitary evolution of this Hamiltonian to a sequence of gates. Um, and there are by now extremely good and almost optimal algorithms to do that. Um, and the number of gates that you need basically scale with um, up to some log factors with uh, uh, um, three parameters, namely, first of all, the system size or the number of qubits, secondly, the, the size of the Hamiltonian, and finally, of course, um, the time that you want to simulate the um, unitary evolution for. So if you look at uh, so if you uh, if you look at this uh, number of gates in, in our setting, both the system size and the norm of the Hamiltonian is roughly n. So um, for the so the actual runtime of the number of gates will square as the well, will scale as the adiabatic runtime times some n squared. So in other words, you'll have some n, n to the four dependence times some gap dependence and some error dependence in there. Um, so this, of course, works with this runtime, but it's just, it is somehow a little bit unsatisfactory because one, so again, one, one motivation that we had uh, was to look at a special case where we, uh, where we consider um, uh, as a special case of, of commuting Hamiltonians, classical Hamiltonians. And for classical Hamiltonians, uh, there are actually algorithms which scale much better than, uh, than, than this n, uh, n, n to the fourth. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this later. So I mean, even, so although this is, polynomial in, in, in a way ignoring the gap um, dependence. This is somehow still a little bit unpractical. So in particular for, for, the, for classic Gibbs states, there are much better algorithms out there. So there's, this we somehow don't really like. So that, this brings me to um, the ingredients for our actual algorithm. So what do we do? Um, in, our, in our paper, we basically uh, pr uh, propose an algorithm that does the following. We propose an algorithm that instead of having an n to the four dependence, um, has an n polylog n dependence. Um, and moreover, this algorithm you can actually parallelize to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to a circuit that has a circuit depth of, um, of, of polylog n. Um, the whole thing works under some 
assumption on the spectral gap that I will discuss in detail towards the end. Uh, and one thing I should say is that this, uh, this runtime here of n, uh, n poly log n is essentially optimal. And there's a very easy reason for, for this, beca uh, because if you have n, n spins and you want to somehow do something with them, then somehow you have to touch at every, every one of these at least once. So, uh, so there's a trivial lower bound of order n, and so this within polylog factors is essentially optimal. And we basically have uh, three ingredients um, that, that go into this algorithm. The first one is a slightly tweaked um, adiabatic theorem. Um, this, uh, the second thing is um, using the locality to, which allows us to, um, to turn um, this sort of global change of, um, of the Hamilton into a sequence of very small changes. And finally, we use Lee Robinson bounds to localize the effect of these very local changes to, um, to a very small region. Um, now, I realize it's sort of almost the end of the conference. So if you just want a very easy takeaway, um, uh, takeaway message, this is basically what we do. Um, we take the geometric locality of this problem and exploit it basically down to the bone to get a speed up um, to, um, uh, to reduce the number of gates from something like n to the 4 to, uh, to this n log n. OK, so let me um, go through these ingredients one by one. Um, First of all, let me tweak the adiabatic theorem a little bit. If you look at numerical um, sort of in, uh, simulations of adiabatic um, um, evolutions, then one thing that people have realized is, uh, is sort of that that the, one of the main sources of the error is actually when you first turn on this Hamilton, uh, turn on the Hamiltonian. So if you so the, so if you first change, you know, so at the beginning of the of, of the uh, Schrodinger equation, first turn the Hamiltonian on from from some some trivial to and in the shots changing it, uh, this is where uh, this is where a lot of the error comes comes from. And so intuitively, what you might expect is if you sort of instead of uh, linearly changing your parameter on on the path, sort of change it um, in a way that. Uh, that begins very, very smoothly, then you somehow reduce the error that, uh, that comes in the overall evolu evolution. Um, this basically is, works, and so this is not entirely new, but uh, one, one thing you, you, uh, one can prove is that um, if you don't have this condition, not only at the beginning, but also at the end, so in other words, um, you, have, um, you, have, uh, you have a Hamiltonian path where all the derivatives uh, vanish at the beginning and the end, and you have some technical condition uh, on, on the derivatives not blowing up too much, which in the jargon is called a Gibri class, uh, then you can improve the 1 over epsilon dependence of the uh, debatic runtim to basically log 1 over epsilon, or log to the power of one plus alpha, where alpha can essentially be as small as you want. Um, so um, this is um, so this is. I mean, as I said, this is not something. Uh, this is not entirely new. But what this allows us to do is to use the uh, uh, this adiabatic theorem as a sub routine for, uh, for our algorithm and by doing a sequence of, uh, of small changes because if you uh, because when you have such a, such a logarithmic dependence on the, uh, on the apps uh, on, on the error uh, what you can what you can start doing is um, is uh, concatenating a lot of these small evolutions uh, each of which you have to do to, um, to, to an error epsilon over n so overall um, you, uh, it means that you don't actually immediately lose um, uh, the, the, the speed, speed up that you've gained from, from doing it n times this is exactly what they're going to do so we use this uh, this slightly tweaked adiabatic algorithm uh, adiabatic theorem to um, to um, to do the following. So again, if I remind you, we have we have this initial Hamiltonian, which is a sum of projectors, and we want to connect it somehow to um, to uh, our final Hamiltonian. And if you look at this uh, this, this local structure, what 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 the um, what's the, uh, the, the tweaked adiabatic theorem allows us to do is to simply, in, instead of looking, turning on all these red operators at once, just do it sequentially. So the way this works is you, know, you, 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 look, you look at the sequence of states uh, where you, where you um, one by one turn out this, uh, this, uh, this red operators. And um, this, of course, defines um, n paths. And if, you uh, and if you concatenate them, you get, um, you get basically an adiabatic runtime of, uh, of n times the, the error that I've uh, just described, which is polylogarithmic poly in, uh, in N. Um, so this is from just from the adiabatic runtime already a factor and smaller. And if you look at the number of gates that you have, um, it's, um, uh, it's, um, it's again, uh, again, you get a uh, N squared overhead from Hamiltonian simulation. Um, so it's already down by a factor of N, but somehow it's still not quite, uh, it, it's somehow still not quite pra um, practical because three is somehow still quite large. Um, and the problem is, of course, that um, uh, in, in this setting, although we only have a very small change in the Hamiltonian at a given time, 
the Hamiltonian itself still acts on the entire system. And as soon as you have that, the overhead for Hamiltonian simulation that you get is, which you know, scales with both the system size and the norm of the Hamiltonian, both of which are n, um, uh, results in this uh, overhead of n squared. Um, so we'll see in a moment how to fix this, but before I go, uh, I go on, let me just make one assumption, which is that the, spec that the minimum spectral gap along all of these n paths is lower bounded uh, by a constant. Let me just assume this for now, and we'll see later how uh, we can relax this, uh, this assumption. Okay, so again, what do we want to do? We want to, um, the problem is that the, the Hamiltonian that, that, that appear in this evolution act on the entire system. So what we would like to do is to is to change this from acting uh, from change our Hamiltonians from acting on the entire system to to acting just on a small part of the system, and uh, to prove that it works, we use uh, something um, called Lee Robinson bounds. So, again, what is the setup? So at a given stage of the of the algorithm, we have uh, we have this in this lattice where some of the um, where, where some of the uh, these red operators have been you know, switched on and. Uh, others haven't, and we have sort of an active site where uh, where we where we're in this given uh, given path, we switch the uh, operator on from 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 the identity to to the one that we want. Now, this now because of the local structure of this Hamiltonian, this change uh, in this uh, in the signal site basically induces uh, induces a, cha um, a, a change in the Hamiltonian that's localized only around a constant region around this active site here. So I have uh, so so in other words, the derivative of my Hamiltonian is supported only on in a constant sized region, and uh, but of course the Hamiltonian still acts on the entire site. So the idea now is um, then to um, take this take this big Hamiltonian, so then Hamiltonian that acts on many sites, and localize it to a small region around, around the support of, of the change of the Hamiltonian. Um, so to prove that this actually works, we basically use something called the Robinson bound. So if, you have, if, if you've never heard of this, it's basically something very intuitive. Uh, it says that if you have a, um, uh, if you have a system with some, def with some defined locality, so in other words, if you have a, a, um, a local Hamiltonian, then, um, then there is an intrinsic um, um, speed of propagation in, in your system. And, uh, you can use, uh, and you can use this and the assumptions on our runtime and the fact that it's frustration free. Uh, um, the, the entire path is frustration free to prove, uh, to prove the fact that basically the terms that are far away, namely more than poly polylogarithmically far away from this change, don't contribute to the evolution at all. And of course, what this allows you to do is to, um, is to truncate uh, this uh, simultaneous. So in other words, just, just, just throw away all the terms that are supported at um, more, than more than a polylogarithmic distance away from, uh, from, from the support of the change. And, um, and of course, this gives you a much smaller region on which the Hamiltonian <coughs> acts. Um, the fact that basically not contributing anything means that you can throw it away essentially follows from frustration freeness. Uh, now, I want to take it through the proof of this uh, for reasons of time, but there's a very intuitive way to understand this result, which is you can somehow think of this, this, this very local change as sort of like a, a time pen perturbation or, or a quench in your system, and then, and then, um, uh, and, and if you and if you then start start evolving uh, evolving um, evolving uh, evolving with this perturbed Hamiltonian, there's only um, there's only a, um, a, I mean there's only a finite amount of time, namely the, the time uh, uh, um, um, given by the adiabatic runtime, um, uh, which um, which you know, um, which allows which, which allows this per, the effect of this perturbation to spread. But because this adiabatic runtime is essentially poly, is basically polylogarithmic, um, the, uh, the the there's only a polylogarithmic distance where, this, where the effect of this, uh, of this um, um, perturbation can, uh, uh, can propagate. OK, so this is basically uh, the ingredients of the, of the algorithm. So let me have a look at um, how, how, long this, uh, how long this actually takes. So again, we have n paths, as before, uh, each of which uh, has a, log a polylogarithmic uh, runtime, uh, or adiabatic runtime. But now each of these paths is only supported on a, poly a region of polylogarithmic size. So instead of, a, a acting, uh, instead of the Hamiltonians acting on the, whole ha uh, on the whole system, they only act on a very, very small part of the system, which basically re um, uh, reduces uh, the overhead that you get from Hamiltonian simulation to something almost negligible or something poly poly polylogarithmic. 
So, um, so the final runtime is n point log n, as, uh, as I've claimed earlier. And moreover, I haven't actually said anything about uh, choosing the order of, this, of, the, uh, of these red operators in which, I, in which I switch them on. So in particular, since, since at, at a given time, uh, the Hamiltonians that I consider are only supported in a polylogarithmic region, I can, I can choose something like n over polylog n of the sites that, uh, who's, uh, where the corresponding supports don't touch each other, so that, um, 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 so that you can basically parallelize uh, th these evolutions whenever, when, whenever these, um, these um, uh, Hamiltonians don't, um, don't have an overlap in the support. And this, of course, gives you then a circuit depth of um, n polylog n divided by n over polylog n, which is, of course, polylog n. <coughs> okay. And again, the whole thing uh, works under some, at the moment, rather stringent assumption on the spectral gap, namely that along all of the n paths, uh, the spectral gap is bounded by, uh, lower bounded by a constant. So let me. Uh, quickly uh, show you how you can relax this assumption. So, 